good morning everyone or good day for wherever you are coming from uh let me just complete the title it's a long title and we'll split it into words and see what it means and the last thing that is very important here is that using geospatial data in the digital economy because this is what the digital europe program is all about so uh as we said we're going to break down the title first because it's a mouthful uh, we'll see a little bit about uh, where in the digital economy the geospatial records have its place. Then we'll talk about what is the fair access to geospatial records and how we can use uh, the e-archiving specifications for geospatial records to make our data in the archives and in the organizations that manage and uh, use geospatial records uh, more fair. And of course, in the end, uh, we'll see what are the ways forward, what are our ideas for going forward, and uh, we will also like to see to hear what are your ideas for moving forward. So let me just begin. First, I have a cake. As I said, it's a mouthful. It's a cake. Uh, we have multiple layers of the cake, and we'll start at the bottom. First, we see we have a digital economy. We have uh, long-term geospatial records. Now, what is this? A long-term geospatial record. Then we have fair access, you say it's an interesting abbreviation, and using the archiving, and that's the order in which we will eat the cake. So first, digital economy is the future. We all uh, are using this, but from the European standpoint, we see that uh, yeah, Europe, uh, the European Commission decided to uh, go into this direction to fund this direction with the uh, Digital Europe program and with uh, many other initiatives. Uh, one of them is uh, the e-archiving initiative uh, that we are talking about now. And uh, as you see, one of the topics in the uh, document that is published by European Union uh, is that uh, the reuse of publicly funded data should be powering the economy and innovation when one of the cornerstones of this public data is geospatial information. So that's why we're talking about this here. And of course, what is the Open Data Directive? It's the directive where all the organizations that create data and records using public money should make those data available in an open data way. Now, what is open data? That doesn't just mean that uh, people have ability to walk into your office and uh, get a USB key uh, filled with the, the data of that office. It also means that it should be available through the web, uh, seamlessly uh, connected uh, using the uh, linked data approach and then with the open data approach. And we'll talk more about this later. Now, the digital economy is here. Uh, let's see what's the difference between <clears throat> what we are already used uh, to and what we used to be used to. So we used to, we used to wait in line for cinema tickets to see the latest movie uh, because in the classic in economy, the products were analog or were at least uh, uh, not available through online means. There was no online yet. And that also means that uh, the e-government official documents were just in paper, uh, we, do, we received the classical services in the classic economy via snail mail, as we call it, walking from office to office, getting the right form, making the wrong form, uh, uh, made, made us walk back and so on. So it was maybe good for our health, but definitely it took us a, a lot of time. And uh, the speed by which we uh, make transactions makes us economically more successful. So what do we have now? In the digital economy, the goods are digital. The videos are digital. Today, <clears throat> you don't have to wait in line to see uh, the latest movie. You just, just choose the uh, uh, streaming uh, service of your choice. And also in the uh, e-government, the official records, e-permits, e-IDs uh, are digital. You can uh, request a change of your ID uh, from the uh, comfort of your home through your computer. Uh, and digital economy services, the commercial ones like uh, Amazon uh, means shopping from home, and e-government means that you can uh, mostly do everything from your 
from your uh, home uh, computer and do it or will be able to do it in the future. <clears throat> and how does it look in practice? So, for instance, we have a Marco and Marco is going to the airport. And uh, here he has an application from the ACME City app, which is showing him uh, when the buses are coming and how full the buses are. Now, this is all well and fine, but how did we get this information? Well, first of all, the bus company equipped the buses with sensors like GPS and uh, tire pressure monitors. And they're receiving all this data into their database. And uh, this database is then available to public uh, through the open data availability so that the ACME City app can request this data and calculate how full the bus is based on how the tires, uh, what, sen what, what sensors in the pressure in the tires say, as opposed to morning uh, readings. Uh, so that we can then calculate how full the bus is. It's a very uh, ingenious way to do it. And this shows us uh, how the economy is actually being innovated and using the data that is available. And that is why we need to build uh, this type of services, because if you build it, they will come and they will use it. And what are the geospatial records in this story? Or let's say more specifically, the long-term geospatial records. We all know that uh, we, we, we cannot imagine driving without Google Maps and seeing where the traffic is. We know that uh, we have geospatial records there. Uh, but what about the long-term geospatial records? And what are long-term geospatial records? Well, basically, uh, every, uh, every government office or agency that uses geospatial records to make their decisions uh, is using geospatial records uh, as an official uh, record. So everything happens somewhere. And if we have this available through an open data access, then we can have faster legal processes, faster access to suitability studies, uh, which means we can act faster, build faster, and so on. And uh, let's say a building permit in our country can last from one year to three years based on the complexity. In Greece, it lasts seven years. Uh, and what you can imagine what happening if uh, a company wants to build a factory somewhere and it takes seven years to build. It's not very good for the economy. And of course, this means that if we have this available, we have faster official procedures. Now, let's be specific, be concrete. Here we have one use case of how long-term geospatial records are useful in understanding the legal decisions that have been made. For instance, we have a drill, drilling permit. Uh, the drilling permit was issued in 2005 on a big meadow. Uh, this is a big meadow, uh, and this was a place where they, they put it. And the permit was actually issued to a parcel number as its location. However, in the meantime, the farmer said, oh, let's use this meadow and split it up and make parcels for new houses. And now all those parcels are actually having different parcel numbers. And if we want to find this uh, drilling permit, uh, we cannot find the parcel anymore. So we need to have the archive of geospatial records where those uh, old parcels are. There's, an, uh, there's another use case from our uh, recent disaster in Slovenia. So in Slovenia, we had floods uh, a couple of months ago. It was, uh, I think, almost 40% uh, of the country uh, suffered from the floods. And uh, in the GIS, you can represent the floods where they are and how they happened. And if you want to see the legal accountability of uh, who allowed people to build in these areas, we need to have old uh, spatial plans to see what happened and uh, who did this. And why was the decision made that you, sh you should uh, build on an area which is flooded? Uh, so, as we all know, the archives uh, support the legal security of citizens and countries by storing sensitive information. And also geospatial records are sensitive information in this case. Uh, 
Now, let's go to the third layer of the cake, which is what is fair access? It's an interesting abbreviation, and it's something that the archivists usually know very well, uh, because we want to store data that is findable, it is accessible, it is interoperable, it is reusable, and so on. Now, what is findable? The archivists know about their catalogs that they use for finding archival uh, records, but in the in the web, who are we making it fair for? Are we making it findable to people, to organizations, or to machine applications? And since we started talking about the digital economy, the key emphasis now is making data fair for machine applications. How can machine applications find the data in the archive? The machine applications are on the web and they do not go through the front door of the archive or the organization that has its backups somewhere, but it wants to see the data on the catalogs that are online, metadata catalogs and so on. Uh, we will go through all these four uh, elements and how uh, we can do this with this geospatial record. So an another thing that is interesting in the level of uh, accessibility is what levels of open data uh, can data be to support machine applications. So this is a categorization by a web page called fivestardata.info. It's uh, something that has been created by the people who uh, invented the internet. And actually, it shows us uh, how mature is the availability. First, is it open license? Like, can I open the data in a PDF because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a format that everyone can use and it's not proprietary, so it's not closed. Uh, that's the first level to be available. The second one is uh, to be readable and structured, like an Excel Excel, Excel file or uh, something that can that we can they can use, but this is still the second level. Uh, the third level is uh, not only uh, open license and readable and structured, but also open format so that everyone can uh, create a software for it uh, or maybe just use some uh, APIs to, to do that. Uh, these three formats are usually stored in a database somewhere or in a file system somewhere. And now we're going to the cloud level, which is if we have the four star maturity of the data, we have uh, uh, data open to the web using uh, URI, so unique resource identifiers, so that we all know uh, that this is the unique identifier for this data. Now, if, if we are using this, then it's much more usable, much faster and uh, and the crown jewel of all is the five star rating where we have the linked data approach. And that actually means the data is in the cloud and can be directly usable with uh, uh, tools like ChatGPT or uh, any other AI approaches. Uh, that's like the holy grail of where we want to go. So how do we support these levels uh, with geospatial uh, specifications in e-archiving? Uh, first, we support it uh, by use, pr proposing standardized metadata uh, and proposing storing data in interoperable formats. Uh, every archive defines a persistent identifier, uh, but on the other hand, also uh, the organizations who are creating data should do that. <clears throat> Then the second, uh, I mean, the next step is to make it available through web access and if possible, uh, use the linked data approach. Now, how do we use FAIR uh, approach with e-archiving for geospatial records? Okay. So first, let's talk about SIDS geospatial. Uh, SIDS geospatial actually means that this is a content information type for geospatial types of records. Uh, we stored this uh, as part of the set of uh, specifications of e-archiving, uh, and it is based on the general specification for preserving geospatial records. 
Now, who is this for? Uh, this is basically for archives who are keeping geospatial records so that they can do it in an interoperable and interchangeable way. And of course, for organizations who manage geospatial records, uh, because also those organizations use uh, records uh, from long time ago in their procedures. And if they don't know where these records are stored or they are not in the proper format, they might have difficulties. So e-archiving is not just for archives, it's also for the organizations who store their data to have their accessibility faster. I believe that everyone knows the uh, can't find that map uh, problem. Uh, and if we are having this problem on a computer, uh, it's even more difficult. Because today, people don't think about archiving much uh, in the organizations that deal with the latest information. Uh, so they maybe put it on DVDs or, or on USB keys and so on. But after 10 years, maybe those DVDs will not be readable. Maybe we will not have a, uh, a suitable uh, application to read it and so on. Uh, so that's why we created this G SITS geospatial specification uh, to explain how we should preserve this data. And uh, we also added additional guidelines for that. So uh, the SITS geospatial specification is on level three right now. It's in the version three. Uh, so it's a bit more mature than just a research-based uh, specification. And with it, we have two basic guidelines. One is SIS geospatial for geospatial records, which has explanations and rationales of requirements. So we have, if, if you want to learn more about it, you maybe should start here first. It's already a long document, but uh, it explains every specification uh, requirement, uh, and it gives an example, and it gives a... Uh, rationale for it. Then, because when we are preserving records, uh, we are doing this uh, from certain systems, like GIS systems. And if we are preserving, oops, uh, let me go back. Uh, if we are preserving uh, the ability to store and represent the data as it was in the GIS system, we sometimes also need to preserve some documentation and information about how this data was used in a system so that we can, that we can re, reproduce the, the, the protocol or the steps for creating the information product. And of course, uh, we also have uh, proposals for long-term preservation profiles, which basically means this is where we uh, show you some examples of how geospatial records should be stored using uh, GML and TIFF formats, which are, uh, uh, interoperable because they are text-based, they are uh, standardized, they are open source, so they are level three uh, stars in the documentation that we showed before. Okay, so we cleared now what SITS geospatial specification is, but we talked about it, now let's go to the specifics. What is the gist of, what is the basics of this specification? Is the structure how to package data into an archival package and what to package into it. So here you see a, a geospatial version of the common uh, archival package. Uh, uh, and the beginning, we have the metadata, which is used to uh, catalog information to describe it and to uh, store provenance and authenticity using all different uh, standards like METS, PREMIS, uh, and so on. Then we have representations where we store the data, and we have a folder for documentation where we store additional documentation that we need for that. And last but not least, we have the schemas folder where we store the schemas so that we can then know where they are when we use them for machine learning applications so that it's done automatically. Now, because... Uh, we are storing data uh, in the representation. Uh, we also have a possibility to store any machine readable documentation in this representation so that when we send, uh, uh, let's say this package to, to an application, it knows where to look for uh, the documentation that is in a machine readable form. On the other hand, maybe not all 
uh, geo packages uh, will have uh, documentation in uh, machine readable form. There is also a place for them in a classical document styles like scans of documents or maybe PDFs, MP3 files, uh, JPEGs, whatever you have that actually documents this, but has more manual approach to understanding. Now, this is a general overview, but let's see a specific overview of this. So here we have a geospatial archival package with one uh, borders GML, which is a open uh, standard. Uh, and this GML is actually a vector file that contains uh, uh, borders of a country or maybe a municipality border and so on. And it also has some descriptive uh, metadata in the uh, ISO 19115 format. So basically, if we can look here, we see that we have a three star content already uh, proposed because we have uh, GML as a proposed uh, long term preservation format. And we have uh, uh, three star uh, content because we have metadata available for it in a standardized open format and so on. Uh, we also have a possibility to send documentation in these types of formats. Uh, let's say here we have the structure of the document in an XML file and uh, maybe a coordinate system defined as in a project file. But we also have a placement for additional information in the one star and two star levels, uh, because not always will we have the uh, luxury of uh, uh, a producer giving us or storing data in the three star level uh, document. Uh, so here we see how we can make the data in the package um, interoperable which is the I in the FAIR process. Uh, we can see uh, where we can make it reusable because we don't need the source application in a proprietary format, uh, uh, but we still don't know how to make it accessible uh, and how to allow for different variations. Uh, the next level uh, I want to present is storing multiple types of data representations. Uh, in a package, because sometimes the organization does not uh, need to change its format because it has its system and will have it for the next 10 years. So when we create this uh, package, we store the data as we use it in our current uh, system. So there's a possibility that we can store the data in, let's say, a two star or one star uh, uh, level, uh, but still have it uh, for our own internal purposes. Uh, next, we have a possibility to have a second representation of the same data, which is in a more interoperable and a long term preservation friendly format, uh, like the GML 3.1. And here we see that uh, we have uh, data on one hand in GML with the schema and on the left we have it in shapefile using DBF files, uh, which are just as an uh, interesting uh, uh, info. In Slovenia, the uh, government cloud banned DBF files because they supposedly offer uh, security risks. So uh, here we see that uh, it's, it's good to then store data in a long-term preservation format so that uh, we don't have to think about, oh, what if this application is not available anymore? Uh, and also we can see that documentation uh, can be stored uh, in the first representation, the shapefile representation is stored in a layer file, which is a proprietary format for, let's say, uh, an, uh, a GS uh, application. And then we have a uh, Python script uh, that is also based probably on the the application uh, in which uh, we did it. In this example, we were using, let's say, an Esri, uh, Esri GIS platform that uh, has a layer file and it has its own Python scripts and its own libraries. So this one is very specific. This one is not the level three. On the other side, we have, as I said, uh, level three uh, data, uh, metadata, 
and of course documentation. Uh, like you see, this, we can define structure uh, in a, a XML file. We can use rendering using open uh, SLD uh, specification uh, behavior defined by uh, an open standard of SQL and so on. But there is also opportunity to store data of an even higher level, uh, which is we can use uh, uh, open data metadata like GeoDCAT and store it in the descriptive metadata folder. So this is something that could help you uh, store the data in a much more uh, open data friendly fashion. Uh, but we haven't, uh, th this is basically what we're working for, uh, uh, working on, on this uh, uh, specification to upgrade it to be more uh, open data friendly. Okay. So, this is about what to put in the package and how geospatial records uh, can be stored. Uh, the next thing is, uh, which we also put in the guidelines on how to store geographic data in GIS systems, are the strategies for geodata producers uh, so that they can actually make the uh, accessible part more uh, available, uh, which is when the data is created, we have a geodata lifecycle. We have uh, data capture, data manipulation, then data is maybe analyzed, and when the results are created, we suggest that there is a preservation activity step before the data is put into the distribution part. Now, why is this important? Because uh, before putting data into distribution, uh, we create a time slice, uh, and this time slice actually helps us to uh, discuss any changes or, or to, to, to make any changes available for future uh, queries, uh, like the use cases I presented before. And when this, this time slice uh, is created uh, during the preservation activity, uh, we can then reuse the data uh, and be sure that if anything changed or, or we have a legal uh, commitment to show how we decided something using geospatial records, we have this preservation uh, step created and uh, it's done. So how do we do this? Well, first, uh, we actually convert the data to accessible format. Like you saw, uh, we, we can create uh, data in a GML file if it's a uh, vector-based uh, geospatial record or in a TIFF file or if it's a raster-based uh, uh, data format. Then we complete it with all the documentation and metadata that is described in SIT Geospatial. Uh, and if we use this to create metadata uh, in a uh, pro uh, proprietary way, then okay. But if we want to have uh, this data fair, then we use the guidelines and use the metadata described in the uh, e-archiving uh, Sits for geospatial, uh, which is uh, ISO 19115 or uh, Inspire metadata, if data is suitable for that. Uh, and there are also other elements uh, that are described in that document. Now, the next thing is uh, we create this package and we copy it to a long term medium. And then we know that uh, whenever we will need this data, it's stored there, it's documented, it's in an in interoperable uh, and accessible format uh, and it's, it is reusable because even if we lose the documentation about uh, and, and, and we lose the we migrate to a new application we know the data is stored in a format that will be uh, accessible because it's standardized and the tools are out there and also if you look at the gml file the the data is uh, pretty much um, human readable so we open the file it's text-based format and you can then read the data. It's similar to uh, it's similar in uh, the metadata standards uh, in Inspire standard. You can open the text file and you can understand what it what it is describing. Uh, next is to export this to an archival repository, and uh, the step that is making data more available is to publish the metadata to open data portals 
and public metadata catalogs. And this is how all, uh, let's say, managers of geospatial records, be it uh, archives or be it um, uh, the organizations that create, manage, and uh, facilitate the use of geospatial records can make their data more fair. And by doing this, they will then uh, give this data and make it available for uh, innovative uh, companies that can make applications such as those uh, to see if the bus is full or not. And uh, this is where the steps forward is actually uh, important. So what are we doing in the further development of CGS Spatial? First, we are actually listening for your uh, contributions, but basically we are creating new guidelines for linked data and geospatial data science approaches and additional guidelines for usage with CRT. Now, what is linked data? Uh, as we mentioned in the beginning, that's the holy grail of the availability of data on the web. Uh, it's something that is uh, still not used in the producer level and so on, but we want to be prepared for it because we see that archiving is not something that you do in the end, but you have to do it in the beginning to make your data more available during its whole life cycle. And what is data science approach? Geospatial data science, uh, it's actually a new way or not so new way of uh, manipulating big data, uh, which actually means that uh, if we are having a lot of repositories uh, and we want to uh, connect to most of them, we cannot use ordinary GIS desktop applications to manage all that data. So we need to use uh, geospatial data science approaches. Uh, and uh, these are the new approaches that haven't been described in the uh, guidelines yet, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have to tackle this issue because uh, it's upcoming and it's happening now. Uh, the second thing was also uh, said that we want to present data uh, using the CRT uh, databases because this is the way to preserve data. And what we saw was, uh, I mean, this is the way to preserve uh, geospatial databases if they are in, let's say, uh, Oracle or some other database. Uh, and uh, and uh, we saw that. Uh, the the CRT approach has some limitations, so we are describing the guidance of what can be done with current level of uh, CRT support and what can be done. But then we would also like to see if anyone from the community is interested in uh, supporting the development of tools to uh, store databases better using uh, CRT approach. Now, what we need to do is first listen to what the community has to say. Uh, so the basic two, the, the two approaches that we are doing for further development are the results of the inputs from the community. But we still, uh, if it's not used, it will be lost, or as they said, use it or lose it. So if the community uh, wants to benefit from this, they need to use it. And uh, by using it, you will uh, see how it helps you. And uh, if we get the feedback, because we maybe didn't think of everything, uh, we can make it even better. And uh, you can also send us your approaches to your best practices to do that, and we will incorporate it, especially for the data formats that were not defined in the first steps, like uh, the point clouds, or maybe you use other formats like uh, GeoJSON or something like that. So if you have best practices to this, uh, we would be glad to get some information uh, about how uh, you're storing this data and maybe create a long-term preservation for profile uh, to augment the specification. And of course, uh, please try the CIS geospatial uh, uh, specification. Uh, I would recommend to start with the guidelines first because it's a more it's a user-friendly document. It's a bit large document, but it's very descriptive. And give us feedback on GitHub yeah. or through our uh, channels uh, available here. 
So to summarize uh, this presentation, how do we get fair access with, geo, uh, with e archiving for geo? Uh, we propose standardized metadata to be included in the geo preservation packages, like ISO 19115, ISO 19165, uh, Inspire. Uh, we can also we are now also working on including the geo decat uh, metadata standard, which is uh, link that uh, uh, link data based, so it's an RDF uh, element. We support interoperable open formats, uh, so in order to have something long term preserved, uh, we need to have formats that are understandable, that are not uh, proprietary, that are well defined, and that can be reused with different applications. So by storing data uh, in a way that is proposed in the SITS Geospatial, you're actually making your data interoperable, uh, which is the I in the FAIR process. The, the, the third approach is to use persistent identifiers. What does this mean? So this actually means that uh, every object has, has to have a unique ID in the whole world of objects, uh, because if we are uh, connecting data to this uh, through the web, maybe there's a house on a certain address, and uh, there's a description of this house on Wikipedia. This can be connected through the link, da link data. And if it has a persistent identifier in the database, then we all know what's happening to it because we're all referencing the same persistent identifier. And uh, we store these identifiers in the archival metadata, and also we add additional ones because we see what's happening uh, with the data through the archival process. Now, how do we create the web access to this data? Uh, by using the standardized metadata, uh, we can publish this metadata to open portals and at least make people aware that we have this data. Uh, ideally, we could publish uh, the content as well, but uh, in the archival world, this uh, is usually uh, too big of an effort. But by even even by saying our, our data is here, you can use it. Uh, we can we can do a lot for this. And uh, are we storing the data in link data? Uh, not yet, because mostly people don't have it in such format. Yes, uh, yet. Uh, but this is this is something that we recognized as a uh, opportunity uh, or a need, and are now working on it. And would be very glad if you have any experience with it. Uh, maybe you already use GeoDecat. Maybe you already uh, add uh, to convert your uh, geospatial records into link data. And uh, any such uh, inputs can be very valuable because. Uh, we will not have to invent new things, but we will use proven and available uh, approaches. And just to summarize the key statements, uh, archives need to support the digital economy by using its tools. What did I mean by that? Archives cannot afford to offer its products in a conventional economy way. We need to uh, serve our customers through the digital economy ways, which is on the web using uh, information from our home computer and so on. And uh, e archiving uh, specification for geospatial records helps archives do this uh, by the means that I explained before. You can kill two birds with one stone by using e archiving specifications and guidelines. Why? Because archiving and open data are basically hand in hand. They both have the same uh, main, let's say, rules. Data needs to be in open formats. It needs to be documented. It needs to be uh, accessible. It needs to be reusable. And open data also uh, defines that it needs to be uh, authentic and uh, trusted. And archives uh, are very good at this because we also document provenance and authenticity of the data. So this is uh, why archiving actually means building data for the future. And of course, e-archiving sees geospatial specifications and guidelines can help you to be more fair. I think that's a fair statement to say. 
And uh, this is where I will uh, finish my presentation. Uh, thank you very much.